So today uh, I'm going to uh, present the spatial interpolation methods chapter, chapter 13 of the book. And the learning objectives are to understand and apply three simple interpolation methods to integrate several methods as an ensemble prediction and to assess predictive accuracy using the root mean squared error. So to recap uh, the geostatistical data, uh, that's the part which we are in. Uh, geostatistical data are observation of the spatially continuous variable Z collected at specific locations S1 to Sn. So we depict them like Z with uh, the S1 to Sn. So we have a partial realization of a random process Z because we only have observations at specific locations. And examples are air pollution, temperature levels at the set of monitoring stations. And often we want to know characteristics of the spatial process as a whole and use this information to predict the process at unsampled locations. That's what, what this interpolation is about. So in the previous chapter, we have talked about Gaussian random fields, uh, with mainly with intrinsic stationarity, which means that spatial covariance and the variogram are solely determined by distances. Also, we have simulated uh, Gaussian random fields using the Matern correlation function, and we calculated the, the empirical variogram of a given Gaussian random field. So to, for that, uh, one can look at the recording of the previous chapter. The chapters 13 to 15 are about spatial interpolation. This chapter is about simple methods. Next one is about Krieging, and chapter 15 will be about model-based geostatistics. Chapter 16 will be about evaluating predictive performance. But also today, we will already uh, see a simple method for that. So the aim of spatial interpolation, it is to predict values of a spatially continuous variable at unsampled locations S0. So to denote these predicted values or estimated values, we use a hat notation above the Z um, symbol. So and the S0, it's for unknown location, unsampled locations. And these methods are simple, which we will see. And these methods share a few properties. They are always um, of, about deterministic predictions. Um, you don't get any uncertainty measures. And the predictions Z hat for S0 are based on the distance between an unsampled location S0 and sampled location S, sampled locations as Y as well as the Z values for those sampled locations. So, but the distance is key in the methods uh, for the interpolation methods in this um, chapter. So the first one, which we will see is the closest observation method. It's a very simple one. It equals the um, Z value at the unsampled location to the z value at the closest, the single closest sampled location. So it's very simple. Um, conceptually, the next method is the inverse distance weighting method. And in this case, um, by default, all z values of sampled locations in the area, in the study area, are used to predict the z value at a single unsampled location. And this goes by weighting. So they are all summed but weighted. Um, and uh, of course, the sum of the weights must be one. And uh, weight is defined as a the distance uh, between the unsampled location and each sampled location in turn. So that's for the sampled location S y. Um, to the power minus beta. So beta here, it is the inverse distance power. And so the, the distance is here in the numerator and the denominator, you have the sum of all these, um, yeah, the inverse distance weighting, uh, well, the inverse distances 
to the power of beta and the sum of these. So as, as such, um, we have a single weight for each um, sample location, which can be used to make a weighted average of the uh, Z values at the sample locations. So one can choose to replace the N, which is the total number of sample location to replace it by a K, which is a subset of sample location. And then it will be the K nearest location. So you, you could do inverse distance weighting um, by just using a subset of more near locations, but it's not a default. And well, in, in general, we normally use them all. But there is a simplification which we call the nearest neighborhood method, in which we also set the beta as zero and the, use a k which is lower than n. So we use only k nearest locations so that the weight equals one over k, which is just a equal weighted average, uh, which we will get of among the k nearest locations. So it's just the mean value of the k nearest locations. So that's the theory of this chapter, uh, essentially. So just these three methods, um, we will end up with um, looking at combinations of these three and uh, looking at their performances. But this is the essential theory. So we need some packages in R to uh, do it. And the GSTAT package uh, will be used for the second and the third um, approach. Uh, we will need the SP data package for the data, SF and Terra to just um, deal with spatial objects in R and the ggplot2 and the tidy Terra package um, to create nice plots um, in R. So the tidy Terra package, it has some functionality to plot Terra objects, like uh, especially spots, raster spot vector objects in a ggplot graph. So let's have a look at the data. So the DEP Munich data, we have the documentation in here. It's just a spatial object of the municipality departments of Athens and with a number of attributes, but actually we just use it to have this uh, spatial geometry of these departments. So there, there are seven departments. And so let's, yeah, just we are transforming it. Well, it's already an SF object, but using the table as table uh, operation and then uh, transforming back to SF uh, just um, yields a nicer printing outputs. And so we can see it's a polygon object, seven features as is expected. It has a projected um, coordinate reference system with a Greek uh, CRS. And so this is the table with the attributes. And as we can see, this is the EPG, EPSG code 2100, which we will use in ggplots. Uh, as you can see here. So this is just a plot of the seven departments and we have set the 2100 um, as um, the grid to depict in the plots instead of just the, um, yes, the, the WGS84 graticule, which is um, plotted by default. So now you have just X and Y values of the Greek grid here with the coordinates in this system. Well, we actually are not interested in the seven departments, so we can union those uh, in order to get just one single polygon. Um, we also have to apply STSF because this just yields a simple, um, yes, just a simple feature collection, which is the geometry column of an SF object. And so this makes it an SF object. We also apply the ST remove holes function of the NNGO 
package. This is not something which is in the book, um, but it has a, it appeared in plot that the map object, if you do not apply this, it has some yeah some annoying lines which are actually very narrow narrow holes in the middle. So by doing this, we just get a nicer result. So we have a simple feature collection with one feature, zero fields. It's just uh, the geometry, and it uses the same CRS as the um, data sets. Um, so the with map view, we can also show uh, the location. So it is indeed Athens, as you can see. So then there's another date frame. Uh, well, it's not just a data frame, it's also a simple feature object and it's called properties. Let's have a look. It's the data set of properties in the municipality of Athens. And so it's about apartments and it's actually a points object. So it's an SF object of 1000 points with six variables uh, like ID, price, but the one variable we will look at is the asking price per square meter. So it's... Uh, it has this name. And so in the book, as is done here, it, this variable is renamed by another acronym, um, VBLE, which will refer to variable. And we are doing the same with the as table operation here. So if we print it, we can indeed um, confirm it's a point object, 1000 features, seven fields. So, and this is the result and you have, can see the point geometry and the newly created variable in here. So it's just a copy actually of uh, this variable. So it would perhaps be more uh, elegant to just rename this column instead of adding another one. So let's have a look at this variable in a ggplot graph and so we, we add the map to just get the area and we add the data which is called d we color the price per square meter we add a color um, scale and the, the rest as before and so we get this map where we can see that the price is much higher in very specific locations uh, compared to many other locations where there is still some variability. Okay, next for interpolation, we need a prediction grid. So we need to define in what location and which locations we want predicted values. And we will do this by creating a spat raster. A, so it's a Terra object. And we we define, we, use, we make it with the Rust function and based on the map as F object, which defines the area, it has 100 rows, 100 columns, and we set the values as zero. So, and because this will just create a, a square grid, uh, we still apply mask uh, map to just set values outside of the map object to an ace, so as missing. So when we have a look at the uh, contents of grid, it says path raster with the expected number of rows and columns. It has the coordinate system which we had uh, needed because we have provided the map object which has that CRS. And okay, it's just uh, filled with zeros or missing values. And the aim is to get predicted values for each raster cell. All right. Another thing which we will use is to plot this grid in a ggplot um, function, in ggplot um, chart. And because many of these things will be the same each time we will plot it, I have created a function make Athens plot. So the function expects the raster ob a raster object and also um, can get a title. And for the rest, it's uh, always the same. And it uses the geoms pat raster fun the geoms pat raster function from the tidy terra package, which will then plot the inputted spat raster. 
it adds a well yes it adds the um outside the border of the map polygon it sets the grids for the x and y grid lines and it applies the same color scale as before and the title so let's apply this to the grid we we have just created the prediction grid so if we do it we pipe the grid into the make atoms plot and we set the title as prediction grid we get this if you look very well you can see that the contours are here but in this color you can see it very well but so this is the area of atoms with a resolution of uh, well, the resolution, it's not clear, but we have, um, yeah, 100 rows and 100 columns uh, in this bounding box. So the closest observation method, it uh, sets the um, value at an unsampled location to as the closest uh, Z value of a sampled location. And to do that, we use the Voronoi, Voronoi polygons so it's the Voronoi diagram um well as we will see in a minute uh, it's about polygons um that have the property that every point in that polygon is nearer to the point uh, that has defined this polygon um, compared to points in other Voronoi polygons so we'll we'll look at that on a plot in a minute so we have the points in here, so that's all the 1000 points. We use the vect function of para because this was still an SF object and we need a spot vector object because the Voronoi function, it's also a Terra function. So the Voronoi function in Terra will then create a spot vector object of polygons. And we provide the map uh, border just to, to say where the polygons uh, should stop. All right, so if we print this, this is not yet the interpolation uh, result, of course, but we will need it to do the interpolation. So these polygons, uh, as you can see here, the they are still in the same CRS and they also carry the attributes of the original point um, object. So if we plot it and we also plot the points, we can see that in these points all points inside one polygon, they are closer to the point that uh, has defined this polygon that was uh, needed to create this polygon uh, compared to points that are in another neighboring polygon, for example. So this uh, effectively defines all points where the closest observation method should copy um, the value of the red points that you can see here inside the polygon. So these are the Voronoi polygons, or this is called the Voronoi diagram. Well, these polygons are also called Thyssen polygons. So how to do this? So we again do the same as before. So we generate Voronoi polygons and then we rasterize. This is also a Terra function. We rasterize the spot vector object that comes out of the Voronoi function uh, using the prediction grid. And which value do we want? We need the column VBLE. So this is uh, provided by, by the field argument. At that moment, we still have a, yeah, a, a, a um, result that has not been masked by the map border, so we apply a mask to just um, cut it with the border of atoms. And let's print the results. I mean, plot. So the make atoms plot um, function shows how these Voronoi polygons effectively copy the values of the point that is inside each of those Voronoi polygons, and you get this um rather discontinuous pattern which is of course uh, to be expected but this is also because values uh, of the points did um yeah go into in jumps you could say so we we have this pattern which um yeah tries to 
uh, which is directly based and equals values of the points um, where we had um, values in the beginning. So to apply the closest neighbor method, we used Terra Voronoi and we stayed with Terra functions. But for the inverse distance weighting and the nearest neighbors methods, we can try to do it in a different way than in the book. So um, at least for both methods, we will use GSTATs as in the book, um, which is used to define the interpolation algorithm. So that will be the essence, um, so to say. But then you want predictions effectively or ultimately for each raster cell. And the book does apply the result to as if points and then converting that back to a spot raster. So uh, it starts by extracting cell center coordinates from the prediction grid, creates an as if points object from those coordinates then filter those points by the map border because the prediction grid is where is square grid. And then it applies the predict methods, um, which needs a GSTAT object and it needs points. Uh, and the advantage of the GSTAT um, function is also that you can provide an SF geometry directly because it is aware of SF geometry. But as you can see, we are doing this in SF points. And then we, uh, well, in the book, is, uh, the Terra rasterize function is applied to, yeah, to, to map the resulting points to predicted values in the rust in the prediction grid. So to me, this seemed a bit like a detour uh, because, yeah, you, you have a you want you have a grid as a spot raster object, and you want to end up in a spot raster object with the predictions and doing it by going to through yeah SF points and then rasterizing seemed a bit um, potentially unneeded. So I have looked uh, what Terra can do. So let's try to stay in Terra. And indeed, it does provide the Terra interpolate function, which accepts a spot cluster and a GSTAT object. So that sounded quite cool to, to try. But um, we to do that, we also need to provide the D, so the data sets, uh, as a data frame, and not as an SF object, because apparently um, this the fact if you would provide it as an SF object, some aspects come through in the result of the GSTAT function, which Terra cannot handle. So it does need uh, to provide a data frame with coordinate columns. So what, which, what we can do is, is start from the SF object D and then make it a data frame. And also this is just Terra um, function. So this is on the spot vector equivalence and um, create x, y point coordinates columns. And so put this in one single data frame. So we, we end up with a um, just a data frame. And it looks like this. So we have all the attributes. We still have a geometry column, but it's not uh, not anymore an SF object, uh, VBLE, but also X and the Y columns, which are essential here to use GSTAT in combination with Terra. So how do we do this with GSTAT then? Um, here we can see the formulas again, because we have the weights for each of the sampled values, and we have the inverse distances um, to a power of beta. And so the GSTAT function, it, it needs a formula to tell which variable we are looking at. The fact that it's an intercept model says we are just basing this on the response variable, the variability in VBLE. Uh, we provide the data frame we just created, and we can use the locations argument to say uh, it is the X and Y columns in the D2 data frame, which define the positions of the, the sampled locations. And then there is the set argument that takes a list of settings, which in this case is the inverse distance power. And in the book, it's the, the 
power, the value of one is used for beta. So these are this is the beta um, for the from the formula. And by default, it is it has the value two. So the larger the beta is, the more uh, the nearest uh, locations will prevail in um, calculating or in in these weights. So and in calculating this weighted average. So that's how this works. So the GSTAT um, object, it's actually, that, that comes out of this, it's actually a special list that has the GSTAT class. And we can be, uh, store it here in the IDW object. And yeah, we can, we can just um, use it as an input for the Terra interpolate function. So we pipe the grid in, and uh, to the interpolate function, which we also pass the GSTAT object IDW and the result looks like and just like we want. It's a spot raster with the predicted values. So this is a little more, I think, streamlined because we can just stay in Terra this way. Uh, as we can see, we have actually two um, layers in this. That's uh, also uh, what you can see here. And what we need is the var one um layer. So we, we must keep this in mind if we want to plot this. So what we do, we do it again, and we do a subset. To, we can use the subset function uh, of Terra to, to select this layer. And we again apply mask map to just um, retain only predicted values within the border of Athens. So then we have the spot raster with predicted values inside Athens, just as we have created for the closest observation method. Let's plot it. So as we now can see, we have a much smoother um, prediction result. So where we can see that uh, the most expensive area is located here, as we could already infer from the point observations uh, themselves. Uh, and the cheapest area is predicted to be here. So this is what we get. And then the nearest neighbors method, as we already saw, it is a simplification of the inverse distance weighting methods, which uses a simple, um, yeah, just a simple mean of the nearest neighbors values. And yeah, so it uses the same GSTAT uh, function. So we can take advantage of the fact or of the relationship with the inverse distance weighting method to set the parameters in this function. So we provide the same data and locations. Um, since we only want to look at nearest neighbors, uh, we use the nmax uh, argument. We set it as five. And by default, nmax is just the number of rows in the data set. So in the previous example, we did not set it because it uh, then took all the other unsampled locations. And importantly, for the nearest neighbors method, beta must be zero so that these um, inverse distances um, yeah, they they we they become one. All right. So we have created this GSTAT object and we use it in the interpolate function. We take out the var one dot pret um, layer just as before with the inverse distance weighting methods and we mask it with maps just the same as before. We get the result for nearest neighbors methods and well, as we can see, it is. It has some smoothing, but much less simply because we only used nearest neighbors um, to infer the locate to infer the z values of unsampled locations. All right. So those were the implementations for these three methods. And then we can also combine these three results, which is called an ensemble approach. So the Theoretically, one can just apply a weight, make a weighted average uh, with where the weights sum to one, as shown here, and which for each method uh, different weight. So the J index in this case, it's just about the um, the the estimated Z values. The J index refers to an interpolation method. 
So in this case, we just have three interpolation methods and we could use equal weights, but we could also um, take some weight that is proportional to a goodness of fit measure as is um, also mentioned in the book. Um, well, this is, I think, also an advantage of um, using the spot raster objects in Terra because Terra supports very straightforward raster algebra with yeah just um, yeah uh, functions that uh, come straight from base R. So you can, if you want to use equal weight, you can just take the mean of three raster objects and then you ha have the ensemble prediction already. And you could also, of course, if you want to use other weights, uh, multiply by each uh, raster by its weight and then sum these, and you will have still in just a single line this resulting raster. So this is also much shorter than in the book, actually, because in the book it's um, yeah done in, uh, I think, with um, using, it uses the vectors of the predictions and then adds coordinates again, then creates uh, as if points object again, and then rasterizes the points object. So this is just using uh, the raster predictions directly. So we can plot it and then have the, yeah, the mean raster uh, of the three previous um, predictions. So that's it. And so finally, um, the book also goes about assessing performance using cross-validation. I'm only going to touch this uh, conceptually because it's quite simple algebra, which you can yeah, handle in various uh, ways in, in, in R, um, more or a bit less efficient perhaps. So the k-fold cross-validations, it's about splitting the data set in k parts, so the data which you have observations from. Uh, you can use, as in the book, dismal uh, k-fold functions from the dismal package, but it's actually very simple and a bit perhaps overkill to just to do this, to install the dismal uh, package. So let's try this with just base R. But what we need is just an extra column um, that assigns values um, from one to K, which we can set as five in the case of five-fold cross-validation, for example. I think that's what is used in the book. And we just need a column which assigns randomly ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives uh, to the rows of the data sets. And then well, and so that uh, five groups are created of roughly equal size. So we can use just uh, base or, um, yeah, some some um, tricks. Let's say um, we we create a random order of the rows, and then yeah, we we just um, assign ones twos, threes, fours, and fives to those random ordered rows, and then we have what we need. So if we look at the 21st values of this K column, we, we can see that, um, yeah, okay, we have groups assigned. So that's the first step. And then for each part in turn, you can use the remaining parts, K minus one, as training data to define the interpolation and use the part itself as testing data where you will make predictions. So you can then compare the predicted values for that part with the um, observed values. And so for that, from that you can compute the root mean squared error by comparing the testing and the predicted uh, data in each of the K parts. So um, the Testing data, it means the observed value. So that's what you have inside here, yi test. And then um, y hat yi test, it is the predicted value. So we look at the squared difference. We sum it and well, we, we look at the mean uh, of the squared difference. And then we take the roots of this um, mean. So we get an 
RMSE value for each fold, and then we can average those um, over the folds, and then we have a performance measure um, that tells us uh, something about the difference of, at the scale of the observed variable. And you can use it to compare different methods, interpolation methods, for example, just to uh, find out which methods uh, works best. So I'm not actually applying it here, but it can be seen in the book. Um, well, we can have a quick look perhaps. So uh, cross-validation, it has this calculation steps. And then so we, we finalize by, by getting for each fold, so those are the five rows, and for each method, a different um, value of the RMSE. And then we can still average these over the five folds and we get a single performance measure for each um, method. So we could tell that in this case, the ensemble uh, appears to have the best uh, value, so the lowest value. So, and that's it. So, um, are there any questions perhaps? Thank before? you. Um, no, at the moment, I, I don't have any questions.